Hi, welcome back, everyone. Today we want to start the exciting module four, network and web security. Uh, we'll cover a lot of exciting topics, the internet history, same origin policy, as well as uh, um, you know, popular topics, uh, cookie tracking, um, the, uh, as well as the process scripting for our programming uh, assignment coming out soon. Um, well, I, I just send an announcement. Uh, please let me know if you're not comfortable with publishing your five minute video. I've already received some requests. Um, and this is again for just democratizing cybersecurity knowledge because I really enjoyed watching your videos. Um, last time we wrapped up our crypto discussion. We talked about the crypto hash, one way. Um, passwords, uh, um, one-time password, the Lampras one-time password, um, and the birthday paradox. And so today I want to say a little bit more about uh, the, the detailed computation. Um, and the, the idea is that you have uh, um, multiple people, and then you just as a mental exercise, you're like, how many of you are sharing the same birthday? Um, Intuitively, intuitively, the number will be large in order to have, for you to have collisions to turn out to be just, if you want to have probability greater than 0.5, just a little over 0.5, then you only need to have 23 people for you to find a collision with 0.5 and a higher probability. And so, so this is a, um, a paradox because you have so many days in a year but why you actually only need 23 people? Again, it's not 100% collision. It's, um, it's half 0.5 probability. And so it actually, uh, we're computing the probability of a collision, right? And by doing this, we compute the probability of uh, don't have a collision, no collision. That is, everyone is born on a different day. So if we have that, then we just do minus probability, then we'll have um, the collision probability. And so we said that, you know, okay, you need to have uh, like 23 people or whatever, you know, you just say, if you have N people, what is the probability of not having collision? So not not having collision, um, you know, that is essentially uh, born on a different day, right? So that means born on different day. Born on, all born on different days. So, so let's see, probability of not having collision indicated with this bar here. And let's just say you have a whole bunch of people. Okay. Um, and so the events are probability of U1 being born, U1, being born. And then in a think of this as a sequence of events so where you have 23 people and they are born one after another. The first surgeon can born on any of the given day. When, you know, so, so there were 365 days to choose from, right? So um, the second person is not so lucky because the second person uh, should have a different birthday. Uh, in order to avoid collision, right? So, so in that case, it's 364 days to choose from. And then the next event is for the third person to be born, and then more restriction will have, uh, you know, three, all three birthdays to, to be different. So 363 days to choose from. And then we use a multiplication relationship to to have, uh, to force those events to happen at the same time. And then if, you know, happening at the same time, then in probability it's world that you use multiplication. 
if it's you say, okay, event A or event B can happen, then you use addition. In this case, for collision to happen, they, they cannot, they, they have, you have to have all these events to happen. And so you can do this um, continuously, right? So let's just see what is the, the actual value of the probability of event one, that is user one being born, the probability of using user one being born and there is no collision. And of course, uh, this, this is, you will always have no collision because uh, you can born on any of the day. The next event, event is the probability is 364 because you have a whole bunch of days, but then, and then, you know, assuming, uh, a person can be born equally likely on any day, and then we are not considering years at all. Um, and then in that case, and, and then we are not considering twins, okay? Um, in, in so they are independent event. And then in that case there, the probability is very close to one. Um, it's 364 divided by 365 because you have uh, 364 options. Um, and then probability, the next event is uh, 363, right? So you, you see the pattern here. And then you go on and on. And then the last person, the 23rd person, because we are computing 23, we're trying to validate why it's 23, has 365 plus one um, number of days to choose from. And then if you aggregate them together, you will have 300, see, you know, this is 300, so this is just, uh, um, and turn out to be just a little over 0.5. Okay, then in that case, then we know one minus probability of collision is just over 0.5 when n equals 23. Right? So, so this is just a value. And then for all the other pigeonhole problem, um, hash, you can, you can do similar computation. Um, so let me just switch back to okay. Um, so that that's that's the end of that, and then you know, of course, collision happen uh, for sure because you are mapping a big universe to a small universe. Uh, rule of sum estimation last time we said it's the square root of n, where n is the size of the smaller universe. Okay, is it? And if you think of the birthday problem, n is 365, and it's close to 400. The square root is 20, so it's a rough estimation. It's not exact number. Um, so with crypto behind us, so we want to say a little bit about the internet history. It all begins when the U.S. government was um, setting up ARPANET, um, and in the ARPANET is it's uh, initially have a few like fifteen nodes uh, in early seventies. Um, support email programs, and this is one of the original drawings, and, and then the log entries, and it says. 11.30 p.m. and talked to Stanford Research International host to host. And so it must be very exciting at the time. Uh, AlohaNet, this picture depicts back in the early 70s. So they have, in, and this is Diamond Head Volcano uh, at, a, at a backdrop um, in, for communication across different islands. And this is wireless communication. And uh, a lot of innovation uh, goes into, um, enabling uh, maximum throughput of communication and a minimizing collision interference, you know, you know, when I send a signal and then someone else on a different island, you know, Wahoo also send a signal and then, you know, you're, you're going to have a collision that, and then you have to resend. And so how to minimize that. Um, uh, 
uh, wind and surf and, and the rubber con are considered the, the fathers of the internet. Um, they invented a lot of the minimalist concept, um, autonomy, really defined today's internet architect architecture. And in the 80s, so which is more of refined, um, different layers added to the network stack, DNS uh, translation, um, so that you have um, human understandable domain names uh, translated to IP address, so which are for machine. Um, and, and so um, Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, from UK, um, very visionary, um, it started many, many um, things, including the first browser, first uh, HTML, um, HTTP protocol, um, and also really his vision was that everyone should enjoy this, everyone should benefit the internet, and so the universal adoption of WWW um, really is to his credit um, and make the software library royalty-free, open, and also leads the effort to um, develop the first uh, web browser, web server code. And back in the early, 80, uh, early 90s, there wasn't a lot of exciting websites and um, not many 3,000 websites. <laughs> in the whole internet, can you imagine we have uh, a, a lot more now? Um, and, and so um, and he was properly recognized during the London Olympic. Um, so so he, um, and, and then um, was rewarded the Turing Award back in uh, uh, several years ago. So uh, also universal resource identifier, he came up with the concept. And then besides all these individual elements, uh, he's just have this vision of how the web would work. Um, and, and so, um, and of course, the, the web is application lab, level layer, right? So the, the network is support, supporting the user of web, the browser. Browser is just one application. You have other applications as well. Um, and the browser is the, the biggest, the, the, the main um, ap application of the internet. Um, and please remember all these protocol names, uh, stack names. Um, encapsulation, just very quickly, you, you can think of this as onions. You have a message, it could be your shopping cart, it's uh, um, need to go to amazon.com. And then the intermediate router switches, they don't have to know what you're buying, which sneakers, and, and, and so, but then they do need the information to route. Um, and so the, the concept encapsulation is just you add on additional headers, but then you keep the, um, the, the payload intact, you don't have to, completely unravel the payload if you just want to access the network layer information. Um, that different layer, you have different names. Uh, frame is a name for the link layer. And link layer is where the ethernet, Wi-Fi, you know, that local area network. Um, at um, the network layer, you need to have, have IP address. Um, and so you, you decode. And so similarly, if, you, if the, uh, the, the, the router needs to know where to forward this packet, you know, how, what's the closest way. Sometimes it's not physically closest, so not the shortest distance because there is a commercial agreement. And so maybe taking a long route. But eventually at the destination, uh, all the, the layers on the pills are off to reveal your sneaker request. Um, in application layer, we know all different uh, uh, ways, um, all different, all, all different uh, cool um, applications. Right? Um, we talked about client server architecture, the main uh, architecture on the internet, peer-to-peer uh, -peer started in the early 2000s. Um, Skype is a, a very popular peer-to-peer -peer architecture. There's n it, uh, Skype is probably hybrid, um, but then a lot of it required to have other Skype users to be online. And so when I was running Skype and then I also run Wireshark, you can test it yourself. I know some of the group are doing Wireshark you will see all kinds of traffic going through you. And then those are using you as a rendezvous point to marry to 
Skype users um, and allow them to, to know each other. Um, otherwise, there's, you know, there's no central server. And so, so the concept is really interesting and it's decentralized. Um, in OS, how to identify a process, PID, right? Um, on the internet, how to, how to identify a machine, IP. And, and so if you have multiple processes running on the same IP, then we use a port number to identify them. Um, so you can think of a, a process, a networked process will, will use IP address and the port number, both of them as, as identifiers. Um, in the internet transport layer, um, reliable transportation, TCP, whenever people say TCP, the first word that comes to your mind is reliable transfer. Um, if packet get lost, get hijacked, get, you know, bits flipped, it will, the sender will send it again. There's a mechanism, uh, they will keep track of who has received the what which packet there is a number if you see a gap they will resend a response transmission udp is the best effort best effort uh transmission you don't keep track of whether that it, that message reached the destination or not um it, it's just um there's there's you know you, you don't resend um but it's fast it's it's, it's simple in a lot of time that uh, the video streaming use use re udp um and, and sometimes it makes sense because human eyes are very tolerant of frame loss if you have one frame lost i'm sure you won't be able to see there are just so many frames within one minute um and, and so best effort, and a lot of times that, you know, HTTP is built on TCP, no doubt, okay? Uh, email on top of uh, a, a TCP because you don't want to have half of your email messages. Um, HTTP protocol by design is stateless. The server maintain no information. Um, the protocol by itself maintain no information about the past client's request. So it's always, you know, you get me a request, I process it, it sends you a response. Very simple, okay? And, you know, this this stateless, you know, what are the other stateless protocols? Um, Markov chain. Markov chain is stateless. Tomorrow's weather it completely depends on today's weather. In reality, it's not the case. I mean, sometimes it's it's also depends on the, the previous uh, weather. It's all related. Um, but but HTTP is is completely stateless. Um, send there's a request and a response, and there's always a request and a re response. And then there's two ways to upload the information. It used to be, you know, if it's a form, it's then it's a post. Now it's just everything is in using get because you can upload in URL field. Um, so so everything can be get, even though I mean it's it sounds like oxymoron, right? You are submitting something through get. Um, so a little bit uh, more uh, cookie is very important for the server to remember you, even if you may not have a user ID, they still know that you put something into the shopping cart. Um, it just try to um, um, remind the server that the state of the transaction um, and then the cookie is set by the server and there's a storage, the backend storage. Um, and different server have different cookie and later on when the, you know, and then some cookie lasts for a long time, you, you know, a month. And so, you know, within, while the cookie is still valid, you visit the server again, cookie, cookie will allow the server to remember you. Um, and, um, and then this is um, uh, certainly um, independent of the, IP address, right? So if you use a laptop, you log on at uh, Starbucks, you log on from your apartment, but then it's the same laptop, same cookie, so they'd still be able to recognize you. Uh, today's web is so complicated. It's not just, you know, you visit one server, you get content. You get content from all over the place. Um, but then with this flat, seemingly flat content, two-dimensional, it's really a structure. Um, you have, uh, it's, it's just easier to traverse a different component. And so HTML page is a structured data. It's called DOM. 
document object model and then just reform and they say dome um this page dome and modified dome um just it's a content and, and so you don't want to get defaced it's there are people would tamper with your dome um the biggest the 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 original like the most uh, um earlier security policy and then the most dominating policy is the same origin policy sop protocol host name and then port those are the the tuples that will define whether an um the origin okay and so if you have a um, code javascript code loaded from one origin and then you also have like a con some content dome loaded from another origin then um the javascript cannot modify the content in the other origin and so so the same origin policy says that if you want to access read write and you, you need to have the same origin and and then your origin has to be deep uh, is determined by where you get uh, loaded where it gets loaded okay um so so and, and, and this is very good concept and to essentially build the sandboxes and so, so when i load from NY times when i load accidentally you know from visit the hackers website they're in different sandboxes and because they have you know hackers code has different origin they won't be able to access um other domain my bank my gmail's cookie um so just a little bit of quick exercise suppose that you have this top url um right so so and then the origin and uh, has an origin and in, in, in i want to know whether any of these urls has the same origin or not um and, and so in reality you don't have to tell your browser tells the, the browser will be able to load content from other origin and then if there are certain type of requests cross origin request um the browser will be able to to say a permit or not permit and so the first one we look at protocol domain and port number by default if they don't say it's 80. So same origin. Second one, same origin. The third one is no, because you see it's HTTPS, but then the one at the top is HTTP. Similarly, the other two also are, I do not have the same origin. Um, JavaScript can set the, the document domain to a suffix of the current domain. So just to generalize the domain name. You can now change it to a completely different domain. You can now you know, change it to hacker.com, uh, but you can re, uh, remove the prefix. Okay, so in this case, store.company.com can be set the domain, the, that's the original domain, but it can be set, reset to company.com. Um, but then the, most definitely you cannot change it to arbitrary domain um and so and then you know the su suffix is making sense like um you you're you're more likely to be it's it's a legitimate uh domain you know, your your parenting domain is likely to be legitimate um but then in reality, we, we see all kinds of cross domain requests. Um, for example, so, so, you know, are these, are they all disallowed? Um, so for example, we said that, oh, because of same origin policy, you cannot have a web app um, um, belonging to a main web server and, and then start to request. Um, and download code from a completely different domain. And in, in, in this example on the left, it's good because you don't want to download code from hacker.com. Um, and, and so so browser would disallow this. Okay, browser disallows JavaScript in a containing page to manipulate document inside the frame of a different domain. So, um, but then, but then cross-domain requests is uh, happening all the time. 
in, in, so you, you see all kinds of content to get mashed up. Um, and so, but, but then we said that, okay, because of same origin policy, you just have things loaded, you know, from different places and then they don't interact. Okay, so you have main party, um, web server content and cookie, and then you have third party, maybe a tracker, an ad, and then they don't interact, which is good, which is good, but, but then sometimes you want them to interact, okay? Um, for example, you want to load stuff from YouTube, you want to embed maybe a counter, um, you want to, um, you know, have some sort of um, flexibility, and then, you know, you, you want to embed Twitter, right? So, so just, um, what are the other common embeddings? I know the YouTube and Twitter are the, the main ones that I use. I know, I know someone use a counter as well. You know, visit, visit a counter, you know, Java, uh, not, not Java, Google Analytics, you embed code from Google Analytics. And, and so that you actually um, um, incorporate that code in your main page. Uh, another example of cross-domain requests, sometimes, uh, uh, have, you, have you seen this situation? You visit, say, Washington Post, some, some news website or Medium, Reddit, and then it says, four of your Instagram friends like this article. Um, so that, that sounds very scary, right? So how does a Washington Post know who are my Instagram friends? Um, so it turns out that the, the most common solution for, the, for all, the, all of these third party scripts uh, embedding is that you just uh, include the script in the main frame. Um, so, so, so like how I embed Twitter code on my website, uh, what the poster can include the uh, Instagram's JavaScript code in its main page. And so the, the client and this is the first step, very important, the client to visit. Instagram has a cookie um, and a visit Washington Post has another cookie and then load the, the Instagram's code and Washington um, Post content all on the, the client's uh, machine. And then at this time, the Instagram script is running, we'll be able to access uh, uh, users Instagram cookie and then send a request to the back server to retrieve friend information and so on. And then that information will be incorporated. Um, and so it's very important to know at this point, the Instagram script will have the privilege um, of the main page. Um, we'll be able to access the Washington Post to dome, um, access the, the uh, cookie main page information because it's inherit the privilege of the page that loads it. Even though some, even though some of the, the code may actually still ha has to be fetched um, from, the, from the, the, the back server of Instagram. But it's really important where this tag is embedded, that that's the, the page that embedded the, the script tag is um, the, the origin of that page determine the privilege. Um, a little bit more explanation if you want to know more. And, and so from Google developer, and it's, and it's very important to know that this type of embedding introduce risk because you have to really trust how good the third party's code is. Okay. In, um, um, so, so another, another way of doing cross origin resource sharing is to have, um, Washington Post specify who, what servers are allowed, okay, in the HTTP header. And, and so, so of course, this is extension of the original HTTP protocol, um, in, and so the, the browser has to support it. And this is from Mozilla. And so the, the Mozilla browser, browser has to support it. You want to recognize it, um, Firefox browser. So, so a little bit summary if, so we just talked, you know, this is very subtle, right? So you have, sometimes we say that you cannot access and sometimes we, we say that you can access and it's all really depends on how well integrated this third party's code is with the main page. If it's completely separate, then no go. If it's 
as part of the main page, as you would do embedding your Twitter code, um, Twitter feeds, embedding YouTube, um, then you inherit the main party's privilege. Then you can access the, the cookie information, you can modify, um, you can you know, share information. Um, you may still have to fetch content from the third party, but then that doesn't determine the, the access. Um, um, okay, so so we have um, so so we have the um, uh, just a, a little quick note is asynchronous um, JavaScript XML and and you and this has nothing to do with security just for usability that so that you don't have to, to wait after you fill out the whole form to submit you know the form is gets submitted as you are filling it out you you don't have to sub click submit like a Google Doc. Google Doc, you don't have to um, click save. There's no save button. It's just uh, being saved uh, as, as you're editing the file. Um, very, very popular uh, uh, modern tech web technology. Um, the HTML, um, so phishing, of course, can be very dangerous, um, bad protocol design, right? You know, ways to work around uh, to, to prevent phishing and, and just remember to use TLS. That's the only way, okay? Check certificates, there's just no other uh, workaround. Uh, we explained that before. Image crash, if you set uh, image to be super large, it will crash rather. I tried it when I was in grad school. I, I think it's probably no longer working right now. Uh, this is only for for Windows, um, well, when I tried it many years ago, it's still working. Um, secure, and, and so a lot of times that you are executing remote code on your machine, um, and uh, which of course is dangerous, and so Microsoft invented the authentic code, and this is just for their Act, ActiveX control. ActiveX is their invention, it was still being used, and, and, and for, uh, locally on the client side, execute you know replicating a, a, um, a code execution environment. Um, you you've probably also heard Java applet, which is for Java you you executing dynamic code in the Java environment. You do need to have Java on the client side. Um, and so if you trust. If you trust Microsoft and then you trust uh, this code and, and, and there's a CA involved, and you probably can see the CA very sign. So it's a signed code called signing. Um, a web browser can deliver malware. I've seen people who have clicked the, the counter visitor counters and, and then they, they're, um, whenever I visit their website, I got all kinds of pop-ups and so it's, it's just, Bad, so you have to be careful. You don't don't just say embed embed um, a no code, especially code like this. You don't know what's in news, new dot PHP. Um, we'll talk more about drive by download. Add a network. Add would you know when they uh, advertisement is uh, this this type of uh, supply chain is completely. Um, not regulated, and so it's it's almost you have no idea who whose code is embedded. Even the main server don't know. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about this web code. Um, in the next half of the class, we want to focus a bit more on cookies and, and cross-site scripting. Cookies, no confusion. Cookies has to be kept confidential. Okay, um, almost. Uh, Almost all the cookies are somewhat sensitive. You know, some are more sensitive, like session IDs. Uh, a lot of times, the session ID are used equivalent to your password. Um, and and if it's standing in the clear, that's devastating. Fire Sheep is a tech tool uh, came out in 2010. Um, it, it just to double click session hijacking. Extremely easy to launch. Um, and after you install as a Mozilla Firefox extension, um, I have a student, um, you know, whenever I hear 
the name um, New Kids on the Block. I, it reminds me of my visiting student from China. He had this little trick that he did. Uh, instead of entering password, he, he would save a URL with his password in it and then just click on that and end up sending in the clear. And right after a file sheet, came out and he got a, a warning from university saying, hey, someone in the U, you illegally download the new case on the block songs. And it turns out that he didn't listen to English songs and, and, and someone stole his identity and, and use that to um, download the pirate, pirate songs, pirate version. Um, so for sheep and, and of course, when you control users' browsing history, you control the information. Um, and so third-party tracking is just so huge. And, and, and you know, you, the, um, people know where you've been, what do you like. It's just, and you bought a pair of sneakers. And then when you open up another news website, it shows you exact the same sneakers you just bought and then you're like what's going on here um when you visit uh, this is a list of domains uh, that you browser will be requesting communicating with when you visit wall street journal and then some of them look really weird i x i a a and also if you go down facebook.net that doesn't sound good um so, so what, what's going on here? And, and um, double click is one of the biggest ad serving website. Almost whenever you go, you will visit well, double click. Um, and there was one time that I was doing a project. I want to, um, you know, if, if, if you have Wireshark, I know some of you are doing this for a project, you will see that, you know, the, um, it, when you visit a.com, you are, you're just, your browser is sending, connecting like many, many websites. Um, in, the, in a legitimate fashion because it's, they have business agreement and, and so on. And, and so one of, a lot of them are trackers. So trackers are not serving content. They, their job is to, to know you better. And so um, if two main websites share the same tracker, then this information can be leaked. Um, and what if the, the main website use different trackers and can they still link you? Um, there, there are still ways for them to link you. Um, one way is to, um, you know, okay, so the problem is that if you know, B and E are two different trackers, um, and then you have a different, the user has a different cookie. So can, can they, is there any way that they, they uh, merge this information? Um, they can, one approach is to guess, you know, guess based on IP address, the browser fingerprinting, you know, like how unique your browser, your OS combination is, you know, version, um, the, and the how closely, closely some requests are. Um, and, and so uh, some of this require you just to have um, um, additional information to validate. Um, it's important to know that Google Analytics, um, similar, similar like as um, YouTube and Twitter, you do a lot of embedding. I, many years ago, I embedded into my website. I think it's still there. 80% um, in, in some studies says, 80% of the web are using Google Analytics and all these information sent to Google and then Google will be able to link them um, and then work with other trackers to link you. And according to the, this, their privacy policy, there seems to be some linking going on. And of course, they want to they want to tell you exactly what they do, how impactful this is. But the wording definitely suggests that they are they are they link they they are um, 
they also track and they work with third party cookies. Um, and so eventually people know a lot about you, right? So, and then, and then the, the trackers also can directly share information about you. Um, how can they do it? So for example, if you visit a.com, um, and then with the A and the B.com have agreement. And um, so A will immediately redirect your requests to B.com and then append in the request saying, hey B, by the way, this user has the ID 1234 on my site. And then B says, oh, thank you. I know this user as, as XYZ. Um, so now, now we know that uh, 1234 and XYZ are, are really the same person. So A and B can share this information. Um, so it's not like a direct database merge, but then it's effectively the same thing. They will be able to easily identify user. And so you just being tracked and, and the US is a, extremely horrible in protecting user pri privacy. European is a, a leader in this space. GDPR is a European new privacy policy isn't there has been a lot of research in this um, but it's a, it's a long long way for us to go uh, in terms of uh, um, protecting user privacy I really remember Google paid a very hefty uh, uh, a hefty fine in Europe uh, for for some privacy violation well written article from electronic frontier foundation um, explaining third party trackers. And so I encourage all of you to read. Before we end, I want to say uh, a little bit about cross-site scripting. Of course, you are gonna learn a lot through the programming assignment. Um, it just injecting unintended code into a website, into a victim's website. And that, that is, is, why is it called cross-site scripting? Well, it's because that the scripts really come from the attacker. So, so it's, and then, you're, and then you're rendering, you being the victim website is rendering attacker's code. So there's this cross-domain aspect, right? Um, and so, uh, imagine you have a, a website that takes users' comment and they expect people to enter text, but then people are just injecting code. And then you forgot to sanitize it, which is very scary. And, and, and this will be um, just a, the ideal situation to launch a cross-site scripting code. And so instead of entering comment, the attacker would enter this so JavaScript, and then it will say, your session has expired, please enter your password. And then this will be rendered to future visitors of the victim site, right? So after attacker entered this, the next user who visits the same site are supposed to see the previous person's comment, but then end up seeing a pop-up window asking for password. And then you see the password gets sent to the attacker's website which is not good. Another example, you have a URL. URL could be um, you somehow clicked as a phishing email. Um, the URL seems to visit a legitimate website like victim.com, but then it enters a search keyword. But the search keyword is not a search keyword, it's a JavaScript access, trying to access cookie. Um, and then the cookie, because this, this code is rendered under victim.com, is, is loaded um, by victim.com, and therefore the cookie refers to the victim.com's cookie. Um, but then because of the URL with this bad guy.com, the, the cookie actually sent to the attacker. Um, so here's you know, a bit more explanation of the scenario. Okay, so you have, um, yeah, it's, it's easy to have someone accidentally click on this URL. Um, so, so don't have vulnerable search website. If you set up a search website, you take user's input, make sure it's, there's no script tags, there's no code. Okay, there, there's, and because you will, for a search website, you will say, your search result for this, this blah is, so there's, you inevitably will display 
external input, user's input, um, make sure you sanitize. Uh, Cross-site scripting, people find that the Equifax after the data breach, their website also suffer from cross-site scripting and this window is at, um, the researcher rendered, researcher rendered window. You're, you're not supposed, you know, in one of the form is it's not doing its job. Um, Equifax, uh, you know, just a little bit more on this. Uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of the attention was paid to Equifax Equifax not patch in a timely fashion. Um, 146 days passed before they patched. Up. Um, and then this this software is um, not not extremely. It, it's I mean you, you have software vulnerabilities all the time. This is for enterprise uh, um, management. You know managing content and files. Um, one of the problem is that it's tried to tell users there's some error messages. But then instead of saying, hey, you, your input is invalid, uh, what it try to do is it, it say, this is your input, it is invalid. And so it try to tell user um, and, and to show, to render um, the, the user's input. And of course, this is a perfect uh, um, setup of, to have cross-site scripting like attack um, because you can give it uh, a command um, and in this case it's, it's not a web situation so you but you know so it's not JavaScript but then you can still you know you can you can ask it to run uh, open the shell and and then the the vulnerable server will say oh we we, we cannot uh, open the shell but this is your message is it has problem but then end up executing the shell okay so so whenever you rendering display um showing the external input to make sure you, you sanitize okay um and, and cross-site scripting is so fundamental you know understanding it um really would help you understand a, a whole range of attacks that all follow the same flavor external inputs not sanitized end up being executed or impacting some other elements. Um, so, so basically all, all, all of these factors. Um, and, and of course, if you stop any uh, of the point, stop them at any of the three points, you'll be, you'll be, um, be able to mitigate the attack. Again, external input, external untrusted input from untrusted sources, uh, and no sanity check, and then the code, the input get executed or um, gets used. Um, and so you may say, oh, such a big failure, right? 140 million uh, user information compromised. Mm, is, is it just a sort of like a, a software patching problem? Like so specific problem? No. No, no, no. Acrofax root problem is complete ignorance in data security and complete negligence and pervasive um, incompetence in the management, in the upper administration in terms of data security. Um, and so, so it's, it's not, it's, it's just a pile of problems. And, and so you, and then you see the tip of iceberg is, oh, you know, this unpatched the um, software. You know, um, they should do is hire more people, more experts who are able to tell them um, and then to have a very proactive cyber defenses. Um, they are sitting on a trove of uh, sensitive information. They should spend way, way, way more effort in protecting the, the information. Why same origin policy cannot prevent attacker uh, like cross-site scripting? Right, so, so we show that some cross site scripts so will steal cookie information, but then we said same origin policy. Um, if, if you have attacker uh, script, uh, won't be able to access uh, uh, the main page's cookie. Well, the answer is that the, the, the script is, um, they're doing the cross site scripting, right? The, the script is injected into the main page and then gets rendered. And so, 
So if the script has the, the same privilege as a cookie, has the same origin, um, there, there's no distinction between, oh, this is attacker script, this is, you know, our original script. Um, because, because the way that the, um, the, it's injected that the, the attacker script end up having the same origin as a cookie. And, and so, um, because it's, it's fully incorporated, it's not in, the, in its own attacker's frame, and, and so, you know. Um, in terms of prevention, make sure you sanitize the inputs. It's very, very important. Um, also, there is this HTTP only cookie which prevents any JavaScript from accessing. And so, so you know, you can set um, in web applications and certain cookies so it can only be used in HTTP requests. And so, so in the in the way that you can send the cookie over to the server, uh, but then you cannot allow code to access it on the client side. Um, so, um, so you're, you're going to see more um, of this um, in, in our programming assignment, which hopefully will come out during weekend. Um, all right, so, so that, that's it for today. We'll, um, sorry about the delay in uploading the video. This is the second time I'm recording this. I messed up in the first time. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you and have a nice weekend.